Before we get started with another Real Talk 447, we'd like to thank our partners on the show. Rocky Mountain ATV MC.com, Slick Products, ODI Grips, and of course, Fox Racing. And please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss an episode. He said, if you can't win, wreck someone who can. Exactly. And that was, I, but I knew exactly. I wasn't winning that. Why do people not get out of the fast lane? Every right. time I see that picture of you <laughs> riding around with that big ass fro you're wearing, it, I still get pissed. It was that night I said, preparate. But I didn't say what I wasn't supposed to say, and that's A1. Summer is here, and that means pro motocross and motocross Grand Prix. So Ricky Carmichael and I are going on the clock for 30 plus two, starting right now. All right, Ricky. How you doing, pal? I'm good. Uh, had an exciting last, uh, last couple weeks. Uh, we took the Triumph Tiger 900, a couple 900s out, and a couple Tiger 1200s. Myself, Ray Butts from Rocky Mountain ATV MC, um, Anthony Paggio, uh, the global sports, uh, sports marketing director uh, for Oakley, and then, of course, JH, otherwise known as Curly uh, Leal, uh, came on our ride. It was a lot of fun. So, long, uh, so we took off from Salt Lake City. And, wait, wait, uh, wait, did you, do you have the wrong email address or something? Is that why I didn't get the invite? Well, no, you were busy at the market, man. Oh, yeah, what, well, what someone's got to work these days. I, I think, I actually think I extended an invite to you, and of course you're like, ah, you're busy. So I'm glad to see it, though. You guys are killing it. Uh, so we left Salt Lake City, ended up being like 2,000 miles total. Left Salt Lake City, uh, rode to Jackson Hole, stayed in Jackson Hole the first night, got up rode through Grand Teton, then continued on through Yellowstone, and then up through, which was my favorite part, uh, the, the uh, Beartooth Pass. It was like over 12,000 feet of elevation, and the riding was just insane. So yeah. much fun, windy, twisty roads. Myself and Paggio, we put the, uh, we put the Triumph Tigers uh, to, to the test. I mean, I felt like in my mind, like I felt like I was MotoGP like almost dragging my elbow, but realistically, I probably was only like <laughs> moved over like maybe this much. So, and then you uh, look at the video, day, you look at the video and you're not even close. No, no, it felt like I was literally dragging handlebar. Uh, stayed in Red Lodge, Montana the first night, which is awesome. Got up and then we made our journey up to uh, Glacier National Park. Stayed around there, toured Glacier National Park, and uh, man, what, what an incredible sight that was. I mean, it, it, the, the riding, the sights, uh, it, was, it, it was a lot of fun. And then eventually made our journey back down towards Salt Lake. On our way back, we stopped in Darby, Montana, uh, where it, you Yellowstone fans, if you guys watch Yellowstone, that's where it's, um, that's where it's filmed. So uh, we took some pictures by there. That was really cool to see. And uh, yeah, met, uh, met, Actually, bro, we met uh, up with uh, Mike Gosler while we were oh, in Darby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So goose. he rode with, yeah, the goose and, and his son uh, Caleb. They joined us on the ride, so that was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, made our way back down to uh, Salt Lake. Like I said, about two thousand miles, but it was a lot of fun. One of the days we did uh, almost a hundred miles off road, which was a lot of fun. And uh, man, just this the sights, and we were just out in the middle the open air of the mountain ranges of Montana and uh, hey, did anybody and get anybody get their ass chap anybody get monkey butt or are you guys all right uh I think JH did but would you, I mean <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less that's that's yeah. actually what I should have asked was did JH get monkey butt I mean I yeah yeah I mean I, I think he I think he did he's got every, hair on everything everywhere that's else jockey. on his body but his head unfortunately <laughs> Man, well, that's that's awesome. Yeah, your Instagram, the videos and stuff looked amazing. I'm stoked. Yeah, and so uh, when the, then we, we were done with that, and then then it went to Loretta Lens, which was a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, Jeff, you know better than anybody just the history there. I mean, you grow up you, your childhood wanting and trying to achieve uh, to qualify to make it to the biggest amateur race in the world. Uh, there, Hurricane Mills, Tennessee, at Loretta Lens Dude Ranch, and. Uh, Went there for, stayed there for a day and a half. It was a lot of fun. Got to see a bunch of old friends, sponsors, and uh, 
there's a lot of fun. And every time I go there, every single year, it just blows my mind, the talent of these younger riders and just yeah. what they're able to do on motorcycles. It was cool and well, made it back home. Yeah, well, I was going to try to go this year, um, uh, you know, um, uh, but I have my kids that week. So I just couldn't, I just couldn't swing it. But I was really interested to know what the scene was like, because we are in the middle of this pandemic. And, you know, some places around the country are still in lockdown, everyone's wearing masks and social distancing. I just don't see that as being <laughs> an event where that could happen. I mean, definitely, they were taking uh, precaution. Certainly, and there's protocols that people need to follow and you know yeah. most of the people seem like they were being they were being sensible from what from what I can tell you know I wasn't there all week I was only there a day and a half in the areas that uh, where I was and I, if I was in close proximity to people um, you know everybody everybody were taking the precautions safety precautions needed so uh, yeah definitely trying times but I was just really happy for the motorcycle community to hear that that race was going to go through and uh take place and uh it was a success well us being you know uh you know we were motocross kids ourselves, and yeah. that was the best week of the year and if you think about what uh this china virus has uh, the problems that it's caused all around the world i mean people can't have weddings you know people graduated college and high school and there were no ceremonies you know there was i mean there's you know literally thousands of events that couldn't happen and if you're you know it, if you're if this is your year right like all the top amateur kids that are trying to get their pro ride and all that for this event not to happen it could it could you know dramatically change like the you know the path of your whole uh, career, you know, of your whole existence. I'm not trying to be too dramatic here, but, but the fact that MX Sports uh, and the team was able to pull that off and have such a successful event, looks, I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, certainly, you know, there's a lot of implications uh, riding on the lines and, uh, and you're exactly right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people there where that, that race makes or breaks them for their yeah. career. I mean, you think of the families that have invested and sacrificed so many things to get their child rider to, to, to where they are. And then for that to be taken away when you, when you're riding, when you have everything riding on that event, because all the heavy hitters are there from the manufacturers and they're out there scouting and uh, looking for their next, next prospects. So uh, yeah, I mean, serious implications there if they didn't run that race and I was glad that they got it done and uh, you know, the true colors were shining with all the riders. They got to showcase their their, uh, their talents without a doubt and, and give all the managers, team managers, and OEMs uh, a good look at what they are and what they're about and, and, sh and show their true potential. Was there any rider this year that had his coming out party that wasn't, you know, your top kids that we all know their names because they're all Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar, you know, sponsored, groomed from, was there anybody that kind of came out of the woodwork, like some unknown writer that, that, that everybody was kind of blown away? Um, I wasn't able to watch a whole lot of uh, as many races as I wanted to, but I think the biggest thing, and, and I kind of heard around the, around the pits and, and his results of speaking for themselves is, you know, you think of Evan Ferry. Uh, he's a household name. Uh, his dad, you know, an accomplished racer, as you know, but we know, we know Timmy very well. But ever since, you know, you go back to where he took that uh, Rockstar Husqvarna ride just before the Monster Energy Cup last year, he went out and he won the MEC race on the Super Mini class. And, and he's really been doing well all year. It's almost like, you know, Jeff, you and I talk about it behind the scenes sometimes. You, you watch riders, things start to click. Mm -hmm. And... I feel like for him, it's, it, it's really clicked. You, you've wa you, you watch him, you're like, okay, you he's, hey, he has all the tools, he has great support, but this, this year I felt like that's one of the guys, I'm like, man, he's making it happen. He didn't get great starts, but he still came up from behind the pack and, and he was really consistent. I think he, 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 uh, 
he ended up with a second and a third against Ryder DiFrancesco. And I mean, I mean, Ryder was just on another level. The dude was uh, in his own zone. So uh, that's one guy that I can just think of right off the top, uh, just because obviously I know him and, and, and I know his dad. I'm sure there are other, other riders as well that had some standout rides. I'm sorry if I didn't mention them, but uh, I'm always just blown away and I go back to, you know, just – what these guys and had just how fast this young this, these talented kids are all the way down to the 50 the 50 riders and remember this is the year they had uh, they introduced the new electric 50 and they had the the e class I'm not mm-hmm. exactly sure what the class is Jeff you probably know a little bit better but uh, that was really cool. I'm not sure what they called it yeah but it's the KTM and uh, and the Husqvarna uh, electric 50 so yeah, that was um, pretty cool and it's it, it's you know it's cool that they were able to um, you know, uh, you know, MX Sports has always been very uh, progressive and open-minded, and say, okay, w- you know, this is the future. We're seeing the beginning of a, 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 you know a new evolution of motocross racing, just like when the four strokes got introduced into the scene in the in the mid to late '90s. All of a sudden, okay, some rule changes. Can we let this bike race with this bike? being electric i mean this is completely different i mean can you imagine like you know think about the peewee classes and the mini classes how bad the cheating is remember remember we were there last year and cotter said that they had to they had to like impound each after or, or each day they had like 20 like cobra 50s or something that they had to like put in storage and just before the race, they had to let the parents get the bike so the kid could race it, and then they put them back in storage. And they were, you know, yeah. they they had to be guarded because they were protested because everybody was cheating. I, I mean, how? What's the rules with electric stuff? You know, Dude, I, <laughs> I mean, had, yeah, I, you can't I check to, like, the CSA. I'm no, you know, electrical engineer. I'd like, you know, somebody much smarter than both you and I put together would, you know, be able to to cheat no problem. I mean, it seems like the, the, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, an advantage would be somewhere in the battery technology. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it, I, I mean, and whether people want to admit it or not, Jeff, I, I think the, the e-bikes is the future eventually. I mean, you just alluded to the four strokes. We all thought it was kind of a joke at first. I'm like, man, these things will never take off and look at where they are, you know, and I'm talking yeah. about, you know, this is years and years ago, uh, 96 97 there's only there's a few outcasts out there on them and and now that's all that everyone rides for the most part at the competitive level so me dude i'm uh, old school old school right you you've actually reverted back to the two strokes and i keep getting smaller i'm gonna be riding i'm gonna be riding a super mini next year well you went from 450 to 250 to the 150 yeah now now next is a super mini Super many, and as I start to get old and my spine, I start to get smaller. I'll just, uh, I'll be in, I'll be on an eighty-five by the time I'm sixty. So, so you're creeping, you're creeping up on age, Jeff. Let me ask you: Have you gotten to the point where you're starting to shrink yet, or are you still holding strong at your, your height that you've been for years? Have you oh, height! To- yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that when I uh, crushed that vertebrae in my back. I, I think I lost a little bit of height on, I think I was like a half inch or an inch shorter now than what I was. I, I don't know, but so far so good. I don't think osteoporosis or, or whatever that's called. Any of that hasn't set in. I'm still fighting off the weight. My eyesight's gone a little bit. I carry a little bit more weight around the middle, but I have been training again. Uh, so I'm fighting it off. Di- How's the diet going? Uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Too many adult beverages at times, but other than that, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, what's one got to live for if they can't have an adult beverage? <laughs> <one>? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, hey, so. Yeah. You, you want to pick on me anymore? No, well, I was just going to say, yeah, man. No, I, gray. No, gray. I, okay, look, there's, there's gray hairs right there. There's gray right here, but this is OEM. I think, and I think our viewers – I think our viewers and listeners come to know that that is not all factory original paint up top. Okay. It is right. what it is. Uh, it is what it hey is. Man, okay. you, know, you know, growing, growing up all the years you went to Loretta's, you know, you, you always heard about, man, what would it be like if a pro national was there? 
And then because of the pandemic, the Redlands finally got an outdoor pro national. I would like to know what your thoughts are on, on, on that. And do you feel like that is just sacred grounds for amateurs only or what's your thoughts, man? Well, I do think that that is hallowed ground and, and there is something really, really special about that event being just for, just for that one race of the year, you know, you know, like as far as motocross, they do a GNCC there and they do a quad race and everything there. But, but for the motocross uh, community, that's like, you know, uh, just such a, such a special event, but this is 2020. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, what do you, 2020, nothing is normal. Everything is completely flipped around. Um, and so the fact that they were able to schedule a pro national there, uh, I think is really unique. And we are at the halfway point right now too, Ricky. So, um, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, we're going to have two races at uh, Red Bud this year. Um, MXGP over in Europe, they did, did three races in Latvia. They're going to do three or four in Italy, you know. So you're just kind of doing whatever you can do to get some racing in to, so that it's it the championship – has the diversity, the number of races, the, you know, all of that that you need to have a legitimate uh, champion, to have this competition that shows all of this, uh, these, these different events of racing. So to me, I think the track is really small and I, and it's not so much that it's small because you know, remember this track is made for fifties CC kids and 50 year old plus guys like you're going to be soon. Like I'm going to be in next year and then everyone in between. This is not, this is not what High Point or Red Bud or whatever, it's not at all the same type of track, right? So I also feel like that, that the lap times might be short. So that means more laps. So what's gonna happen, and you've been there, you were just there last week watching, how bad does that track get chewed up? Like it's well, gonna be gnarly. It's going to be rough, rutted, gnarly, because I feel like unless they can extend the track somehow, it's going to be pretty brutal. And it's going to be well, tough. hot. It could rain. Who knows? And that's the first thing that I noticed when I was there, Jeff, is just how rough it was. Now, they've, they've hauled in and imported a lot of sand at that place. Mm -hmm. So it is really rough. And almost the back, I'm like, man, I don't want any of this. You know, it was so rough, like arm pump city. So, and to your point, Exactly. Uh, I think the biggest thing that the riders are going to notice, just how tight it is, uh, how short everything is as far as, as far as what they're used to riding. Uh, they're not really going to, in my opinion, feel like they're going to be able to air it out and really let the big dogs eat, if you will. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think it's going to be very rough. I think it's going to get chewed up quite a bit. Now, there's less racers at a pro national than there is at an amateur national, obviously, but uh, I was just, I was blown away at how rough it was for the amateur national. So uh, from a difficulty standpoint, if it gets really rough, like it was at the amateur national, it's going to be a lot of fun to see who's in shape and, and, and who is it from a pro side. But I do think it's, um, it, it, it's small compared to what they uh, normally run. However, uh, I, w I do feel you see like- see that right there? Yeah. Look at the weather forecast. Friday, Saturday rain. Yeah. So I do feel like I, it, it's going to be interesting. I, it's an unknown for me. Um, I will tell you, though, I'm excited for these guys uh, to get uh, an abbreviated um, season in. You know, instead of 12 races, they're only going to be able to do nine. They have nine scheduled. Hopefully they're able to uh, get the, all of those rounds in. That would be great to see. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to watch some racing on NBC. It's going to be a lot of fun, uh, but it's going to be exciting as well um, to, to watch these guys battle at Loretta's. Uh, I'm kind of with you. I feel like it's sacred ground, but through trying times with the pandemic going on, you know, they had to get these nationals in or get as many nationals in as they possibly could. And yeah. this is one of their best options. Uh, the GPs yeah. have been great. I've been watching a lot yep. of guys sitting in the deck. The old man, um, Cairoli, getting up there on the Vox. That was great to see. Uh, a lot to look forward to. 
Yeah. So does the track, uh, this race being at Loretta's, does it give anybody an advantage to the, to the riders that were once kids there growing up? As you know, I, like uh, who well, I was reading a thing, what Ferrandis, Muscan, uh, you know, some of the Euros, whatnot, they would have never raced there, you know, the Lawrence brothers. Well, well, or, uh, or Jet raced last Jet, year. Jet, ra Jet raced there last year. So you got to think that he automatically has an advantage over his brother. He's going to know what that's like. Now, his brother, I don't know if his brother was there. I don't know if Hunter was there watching last year, watching Jet race, but. Watching the watching a track and riding the track, in my opinion, are two different things. Until you're on the track, you know what the grip level's like, the slip angles are like. Um, watching it doesn't do it justice. So well, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. So you would have, as as an amateur, the last time you raced there, you'd been riding 125. When you came at, back to do that that race, you're riding a 450 Suzuki, right? that bike is a lot of bike for that track. Now they're obviously, you know, the crew's going to get in there and build some jumps and do the things that they need to do. But for the most part, I mean, it, you know, it's pretty small. So yeah, the one thing, the one thing I noticed, Jeff, and I don't know if, if you notice, I mean, so my memories of Loretta's, I mean, the bikes were a lot slower than we were on two strokes and uh, things were a lot different. Um, I just remember going there when I think it was 2012, Yes, on the 450, and I just remember it was, I could never get in a rhythm. I couldn't find that rhythm, and I just believe, honestly, now thinking about it, talking to you here on our uh, 447 uh, podcast, I, I feel like it was because just the bike was too, it was, there was a lot of power, and it wasn't designed for that style and, and that caliber of motorcycle. And that's probably well, well, remember, I remember being so bummed because my expectations were so high and I got out here. I'm like, damn, this isn't what I remembered it to be. Not yeah. that, you know what I mean? And it changed, not, it changed quite a bit during that time period too. It would have gone from being a little more hard pack and the regular dirt to starting to have that transition there where, where they were bringing in a lot of extra dirt. Um, but remember a few years back when Robbie Raynard rode that 125 Yamaha in the, plus 25 class or 35 or whatever he was in at the time. Yeah. And he didn't get, he didn't get the whole shots, but, but he on the track, he was faster than everybody else. I'm convinced that at least at the amateur race that you're better off riding a smaller displacement there. But you know, once you get to the pro races, it's like, there's no replacement for displacement. Yeah. It's crazy too watching the, uh, the amateur guys going through the 10 commandments. They're like triple, triple, triple. We're back in the day. I mean, if you could just get through there going double, 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 you were doing something. So uh, that's just you know, the technology and talent levels and just how much they've exceeded from, from our day. But I'm excited. Um, interesting, interesting that the 94 isn't racing. Uh, I think everyone's yeah, awesome, yeah. like, that's interesting. Um, you know, you, you never know. You never know the backstories on anything, and and I haven't. Asked, I certainly haven't asked, you know. But so what's the what's the reasoning? I mean, I read the press things on Instagram and whatnot, and that it, he 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 needs his body to heal or or something to do with his health and whatnot. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I know I know as much as you know, Jeff, about you know what what the presser presser said and what Instagram said. So. Uh, it's definitely different, you know, and then I just wonder, like, how long did he know this was coming, you know, like, was yeah. this just a spur of the moment thought? Because, you know, you watch his Instagram, and it seemed like he was out testing and all that stuff, and something occur uh, where he had to pull out at the last minute, who the hell knows? So, um, ah, but if you, I mean, he's such a premier writer, the great personality, you know, the, the companies, Red Bull, Honda, Fox, that they've got so much invested in him is such a such a key part of the marketing this being the core part of the marketing season where new lines are being released and and this is when the core riders you know and especially the growth that we've had in the off-road industry um man it's a it's a it's a bad time to lose your top athlete 
you know, yeah. in this, in this regard. So hopefully yeah. he's all right and his health or whatnot is. Uh, yeah. And maybe there were some underlying issues. Uh, remember at Salt Lake city, there were some issues clearly. Uh, yeah. 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 With the physical performance there, he even said it. So uh, maybe there's some underlying issues there, but uh, hopefully he's a, he is able to rest up, take this uh, time that he's saying he's needing and he'll come out firing and uh, be ready to go for next season's uh, monster energy supercross. But, uh, Hey, we, we got we got this. we got five minutes plus two to go. Yeah, we're I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna go on the spot. Who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna win these titles this year? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you you know my my blanket answer is the guys with the number one plates. I, they've earned that right. I mean, you, you have to go with Eli Tomac. Uh, he finally got that uh, and achieved that championship that has haunted him for so many years. The Monster Energy Supercross Championship. I mean, you, you, you just have to think, I mean, if I, and if I was in his helmet, obviously I'm not, but that confidence that he got from winning that championship to now going into a championship that he's won so many times already, I mean, so long as he uh, continues the, the pace that he's always had in outdoors, I mean, and minimizes any damages or catastrophes, I mean, the guy, he has the upper hand on everyone. That's that, yeah. that's my opinion. Uh, as far as the 250 goes, I think that uh, Dylan Ferrandez is going to come out firing, you know, because uh, Adam Sansarillo, the champion, uh, he's moved on to the premier class of the 450, so he's not going to be in there. Uh, but I think, you know, a guy like Dylan Ferrandez is, is, uh, is going to be there. Justin Cooper, uh, he, he had some great rides last year as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the younger guys, you know, what's Hunter going to be able to do? What's Chet going to be able to do? Uh, the Lawrence brothers are always a lot of fun to watch. And, um, I'm going to, you know, for the 450, I think, um, definitely the three for sure. The 250, it's anyone's, it's anyone's game. And, uh, regardless, I'm, I'm excited for it. And they only have nine rounds and things are going to happen really fast um so they're not going to have a lot of races to recover from bad motos bad overalls you're going to have to be on your a game it's really putting these guys in the pressure cooker yeah the 250 though i'm looking at the lineup right now you know the entry list i'm just like oh okay so, I mean, just that you know, Martin, McElrath, Fernandez, Hampshire, Hampshire, uh, Alex Martin, McAdoo, Hartraff, Justin Cooper, Hunter Lawrence, it just goes on and it's, on and on. I mean, it's absolutely stacked, you know, and yeah. it's so much fun. And honestly, I think you'd be guessing, like people always, people, I mean, you even give me a hard time for not picking who's going to win. Honestly, I, I can tell you who I think has a good chance but i can't tell you who's gonna win They're, that field is so stacked well i do that but if you but if you remember i never go out on the limb anyway i i like deflect it and i put it all on you and then i talk so much shit that i just and by the time you don't answer i've already moved on so i actually never i never <laughs> yeah you never record. <laughs> yeah you, you, you never you never commit uh, it's an advanced just, technique, Ricky. It's an advanced technique. Yeah. Do you I'm like never wrong. in the 450 class? I mean, you got to like the three, right? Yeah, I certainly do. But I, I, I think you're going to see Webb. Webb's going to step up again this summer. And man, I, I mean, the 250 class, I'm sitting there, I was looking at the list and I'm like, I don't, I don't know who to go with. So I'm going to go with Justin Cooper, my guy running the Amic Pro Grip. He's, yeah. he, he had a really good season last year. He learned a lot. He won a Supercross, um, learned a lot again. Um, but I think he's got what it takes. And I, if, uh, I think he's definitely a contender. So I'll go with well, uh, yeah, Webb and yeah. Justin Cooper. And, and, and he's raced there before. So against his teammate, um, Dylan Ferrandis, who I, was, who I was talking about, keep your eye on. Dylan's never raced there. You talked about it at the top of the show. So it, it'll be interesting either way. See, this is what I love about the 250 classes. We don't know who's going to win. And that's, I think, from a fan's perspective, that's what we all want. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be for the championship. It's going to be, it's going to come down to which guy can minimize the damage. I'm telling you guys right now, all of our viewers and listeners, Nine races might seem like a lot, but it isn't. 
And these yeah. guys really have to be really consistent. And I'm hey, we got, we, got, we got 30 seconds left. I'm going to give a shout out to the MXGP guys. We burned through this 30 minutes pretty quick. Certainly easier to do it here than when we were racing. Hurling's 28-point lead over Geyser. Uh, Caroli, 90 MXGP wins now. He has won a GP every year since 2004. Koldenoff got a win. Uh, Jack Kikonis got a moto win. So uh, that championship in the 250 and 450 is exceptional also. So tune into that. Yeah, that's uh, th those guys at Latvia. I I'm bumming I never got a chance to race at Latvia. I think I would have. Uh, I think I would have liked that that course, the sand and stuff. As long as it wasn't a motocross of nations, that wasn't your best race, dude. That <laughs> you're right. So all right, thirty minutes. All right, up, we're on the two lap 30. signal. All right, thirty. You go. You go first. Okay. So, uh, thirty plus so two. Question for you. Question for me. Plus two. Okay. Who is the standout of the younger guys in the 250 class this weekend at the Pro Motocross Race in Loretta Lens? Who do we watch for? Who's your eye on for the rookie coming up? Well, it's got to be, uh, um, um, would it be Mumford? Mumford. I'll go with Mumford. Mumford. All right. And you then? I'll, I'll throw it right back to you. Well, I think you got uh, Styles Robertson. Mm, he was good this week. Yeah, he was good. So between those two, uh, I got my I got my eye on him. That'll be a lot of fun to watch. See how he does on that rock scar uh, Husqvarna. So either way, it's gonna be good, dude. I can't wait. Yeah, it'll be great. All right. Well, that was that was thirty minutes, just like that, dude. I'm telling you, way easier to do it here than when we were on the bike each and every summer. But we don't have to do it again in another hour. It'd be a week. So we have a week to recover, right? Much yes. better. Well, dude, it's good to catch up with you. And I'm stoked uh, that we've got Real Talk 447 back going for the summer. Uh, once again, with all of our fantastic sponsors, Rocky Mountain, ATVMC.com, Slick Products, ODI Grips, Fox Racing. Make sure you go to their websites and check their stuff out. Um, so we're going to be back each week to discuss uh, motocross and MXGP. Uh, plus, we have a ton of additional content coming your way uh, throughout the rest of this year that we've been working on. I know we've been a little bit quiet after Supercross was over and, and all that, but we are uh, really trying to put together some great content here on Real Talk 447. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, please click the subscribe and the like buttons. Well, if you liked it. And uh, Ricky, do you have any parting words for us? Hey, thanks. Uh, glad to be back. Always great to see your face. And uh... Really excited to uh, share some fun content with all of our viewers and listeners. Thank you for tuning in to Real Talk 447. Uh, this uh, 30 plus 2 edition is going to be a lot of fun, and uh, we'll have a lot to talk about after the opening round of the Pro Motocross Series. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you guys next week. Well, that's our show. And as always, we will uh, sign off with the Andrew McKeague Band and this old lie. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.